So I went from desire. We talked about hope, expectations, anticipation, faith. If you anticipate rain, you will carry an umbrella. So our Lord Jesus Christ had an anticipation, an expectation. His Father will always be with him. He will never let him down. He trusted the goodness of his Father. He never had any doubt about the goodness of his Father. That's very important. So how are we posturing ourselves in this year? How are we positioning ourselves this year in order for us to accomplish the things that God has prepared for us to accomplish. Let's read John 8, 29. John 8, 29. Okay, um, your translation has made something very, very clear. The expanded Bible says, the one who sent me is with me. I always do what is pleasing to him. So he has not left me alone. How many, how many of us in the church today can make such a statement? I mean, with knowing, you know, a lot of people say, God is with me, God is with me. But the next time they hit a challenge, you got to see the way they re react. They act as if God is not with them. And I'm talking about in the church. So our Lord Jesus Christ coming into this world, he had an understanding in the spirit with his father. Are we at that level? Do we? And it's conditional. The, my father has not left me alone. What was the first step? I always do what is pleasing to him. He is with me. He has not left me alone. God is always with me. Do we anticipate that? I mean, come on. Uh, do we think he will? Do we really know he will? If, if you watched the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, he never acted like anything surprised him. He never acted like anything surprised him. He had so much confidence in his relationship with his father. This father-son thing between our Lord Jesus Christ and his father was huge, huge. You see, 
a lot of people have a loyalty, a misplaced loyalty, or so-called loyalty, but they can flip on you anytime. So they have loyalty to the church, they have to the congregation or church, or whatever you call it, to the preacher, as long as they expect something from there, but their loyalty is not with God. Their expectation is not with God. Okay, let's read John 10, verse 54. John 10, what? 54. John eight fifty four. John eight fifty four. John eight fifty four. Yes. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. He does what? He says, I honor my father. I give honor. No, here he says the father honors him. I, if I give honor to myself, okay, no, that's not what I wanted to say, to use. Uh, I think that would be John 10. But I'll give you that scripture. He said, I honor my father. Our Lord Jesus Christ made a point to honor my father. In the meantime, let's read again John 8, 28. Let me revisit that scripture. He said he does nothing on his own initiative. He does nothing on his own initiative. Again, pleasing the Father. Nothing. Wow. Okay, can somebody give me some examples of nothing? I do nothing on my own initiative. What does that include? Everything. Some examples of that we generally might not even think God would want to be involved in that decision. Where we go, what we say. There we go. I do nothing on my own initiative. Nothing on my own initiative. What does, what, what does that require? In order for you to walk like that with God. See, I'm trying to lay the ground for momentum for us to take off the right way in this year. 
before we can go into the training and the things that I will be teaching in the future. I mean, Momentum 2017. In order for our Lord Jesus Christ to say something like that, what kind of work would that require between him and the Father? What kind of depth of intimacy would that require between him and the Father? What kind of relationship would you have to have with the Father in order to accomplish that? See, this is describing the nature of Jesus Christ. The rules he lived by, if I can say that, you're going to have to have such intimacy with the Father. Let's read John 10. And read from verse 3. John 10. Actually, we can go all the way to verse 5. From John 10, start from verse 2 all the way to verse 5. I hear you. Wow. What is the key here? Hearing the voice of the shepherd, right? Unless you hear the voice of the shepherd, how would you be able to follow him? Is that fair? Most people in the church don't hear the voice of God. Am I right? That's why they get confused constantly. People come and ask me, Pastor, is it okay for a Christian to watch this movie? I never answer such questions. Now, watch verse... Uh, watch verse 3. Evangelist, read verse 3 again, please. Who, who, who is the gatekeeper? It's the pastor. The pastor of the church is the gatekeeper. My job is to open the door to let the sh shepherd come in and help you to hear his voice so you may follow him, not follow me. This is very important for whoever wants to be in ministry. It's not about you. It's not your people. They're not supposed to follow you. But today, people come to the preacher 
prophesy on them about them, about their spouse, about their children, their grandchildren, their job, who they will marry, who they will divorce, you know, where they, you know, it's like pastor, you know, people constantly, oh, oh, what, what has God told you about me? I'm pushing you to him. In this hour, the new leadership, the new apostolic leadership of the church needs to raise people and train people to, to make it a lifestyle of hearing God's voice through intimacy. Most of the people are more intimate with the pastor than they are intimate with God himself. So they'll come running to you. Now, the preachers love it. Because when you come see me, then you give me the prophet's offering. And this syndrome must stop. If we are to raise up a people, I mean, the majority of the people in the church is not ready for the end times. Because he says, they know my voice. They will not follow the voice of a stranger. Who is the stranger, the deceiver, the Antichrist? He has a voice. Many will follow him. Because they don't know the voice of God. Just look around the church. Look at the, this issue of homosexuality is a determining factor in the end times. But most Christians are confused about it. Because they don't hear the voice of God. I run into a number of people And I'm talking about leaders. The church today is run based on our talents, not the voice of God. Talent, it's the soul, it's soulish. The soulishness is the flesh. Your own ability. You heard people say, bring your talents to God and he will use it. Oh no, that was a big lie. When you come to God, the first thing that must happen is you must die to yourself. And yourself includes all those abilities. God never called us to serve him. He never called us to do things for him. He called us to be vessels so he can do things for himself through us. And so most of the training in the theology schools and all that, you know, I asked God at the end of 2012, I said, Lord, do you want me to go study theology? I'm not a theologian. He said, no. I said, wow. Well, I don't know what this means, but, you know, people would like you to have a PhD in divinity. Okay, what does that mean anyway, PhD in divinity? You know what I mean? We know God by revelation. And so, when you come to God, You must totally die. And then he used it. This was exemplified in the Temple of Solomon. When Solomon finished building the temple, what happened? Can somebody tell me? Okay, you don't know the story?
when Solomon finished building the temple, the glory of God descended into the temple. There was so much glory. The priests were disabled. They were on the floor. What does that tell you? The priesthood was disabled and the glory of God went to work. That means God himself wants to be the one going to work in his house. What is, as leaders, what we need to do is build a house and set an atmosphere by following the instructions exactly as God instructed to build the house. This happened with Moses. The Bible says when Moses finished building the house exactly as God showed him on the mountain, the glory descended. I'm going to ask you a question. Come on, let's be honest. When we go to church and to, we say, oh, today there was so much glory. Are you serious? Is that really the glory? That's probably because you've never seen the glory. You've never had an encounter with God. Some of what we call the glory in the church is just funny. People running all over the place and, and we call that the glory. We want the real glory. And so we want to take off the right way. We want our hearts and our minds focus on the, the right thing. My role as a gatekeeper is to open the door and allow the shepherd, the good shepherd, to go to work. And we're going to study, we're going to pray for the ears of our inner man to be open so we can walk a lifestyle of hearing God's voice. In the end times, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4, the disciples asked Jesus, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Can you imagine? He didn't tell them about the Antichrist will come, the false prophet. Uh -huh. He said, make sure that you are not deceived. Deception. The counterfeit, the false Christ, the false voice, the voice of the stranger in the church, in the house of God. So the only way that you will not be deceived is for you to become familiar with the voice of the good shepherd. And I don't mean you heard his voice two years ago, you're still talking about it today. I mean, if you were married to somebody and they talk to you once a year, you would not be celebrating. He says, the good shepherd, you know, uh, the one who guards the door, the watchman, the gatekeeper, opens it for him. And the sheep listen to the voice of the good shepherd. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he brings all his sheep out, he goes ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they don't know his voice. There are many voices today in the church. You see, for centuries, the church has been mostly evangelical. And, 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 and for many years, uh, somebody would get a little revelation and build a doctrine around it and start a denomination. And somebody else hears one other revelation and builds another denomination 
around it and then build walls between him and the other denomination. So you're not even supposed to talk to your friends from the other denomination. You're not even supposed to go for a conference. They, they put it into your mind that we are the only ones with the truth. First of all, you did not get the whole truth. You know, when Martin Luther in Germany started the Reformation movement, when he opposed the Roman Catholic Church over the doctrine of salvation by faith, when he nailed his thesis on the door, he got a revelation. See, God gives revelation progressively. He got the revelation of salvation by grace alone. You don't deserve it. You don't pay for it. You just receive it. But after that step, God came back and brought a new revelation. And somebody else said, excuse me, Mr. Uh, Luther, you are still baptizing babies by aspersion, by sprinkling water. But God has just opened my eyes that he wants people to be baptized by immersion and you cannot baptize babies. Babies cannot make a choice. He got angry at them. They challenged his authority. That's the way he felt. So he drove those people out. And those people went and started a new movement, the Anabaptist movement. And the two camps became antagonistic one to another. And so now the Anabaptists, all they know is we are the ones that baptize the correct way. Martin Luther got so angry, he cursed them. When they go baptize people in the river, let crocodiles eat them. This is written in the books of history. He got angry at them. But he got one revelation. The problem is when God gives one revelation, people create rigid structures. And then they invent a, a, a number of human doctrines to help people become holy without an encounter with God. Doctrines will never give you life. So we had all sorts of doctrines. Women have to put a wrap around their heads. They have to wear these blouses that get to this point. You cannot wear jewelry. You cannot go to watch football game. You cannot do this. And so they created all these things to help people become holy. And so people grew up in the church and they were never transformed. They were never transformed. And as a result, people learned to act a certain way in the church. So they, they began to play games. They wear masks because they really don't have transformation. Only encounter like the Damascus Road encounter soul, encounter Jesus, Nobody had to tell him nothing. I am praying that everybody that is attached to this ministry will have that personal encounter this year. This is something that you need to cry out to God for. You need your own experience. And I'm not talking about somebody laying hands on you and then you fall down. You've been falling down every day and coming back up the same. What does that mean anyway? You, you believe that the Holy Spirit, all he wants to do is just knock you down? The scriptures tell us that when the Spirit comes, he will reveal Jesus to you. Encounter. Experience. You need an encounter. Your own encounter not your pastor's encounter. You see, people like uh, William Branham, 
that generation of people, we've had some great men of God and women. Kathleen Coleman. See, those people had real experiences with God. The mistake they made is they commanded so many followers, but they did not train those people on how to get an encounter for themselves. I talk about forerunners in this ministry. A forerunner is somebody who will go ahead of others like Joshua, see what it is God has done, see what it is God has given us, and then come back and tell others, hey, we can go, we can get this, we can do this, this is real, God is with us. Those Amalekites, we can overcome them. You know, all these issues that you experienced growing up, the rape and the rejection and all that, that you wake up in the middle of the night and wallow in self-pity and all that thing that consumes your mind, we can overcome that. Let's go. Those are forerunners. But because the other ten spies and the whole nation rebelled against that, only Joshua and Caleb, the men forerunners who had a good report to, to, to give to the people, they're the only ones that entered into the promised land with the, the next generation. They became the leaders of the next generation. Today, the new apostolic movement must change the way we teach people. We can't just be giving people all these theological words, all this jargon, Christian jargon. We need to take people by the hand. That's why, you know, I, I don't have to have 10,000 members. If I have 10 people, and I can push them into that place in God where you walk hand in hand in intimacy, where you hear the voice of God on a daily basis, when it becomes a lifestyle. That's much better. We can change the whole world if, if we can accomplish that. No, I will accomplish that with those God has given me. And so the momentum 2017 this year, I really only want the people who really want God. People who want God. See, in this ministry, we are not after the things of God. You see, the, the, when Jesus was on the earth, the Father testified about Jesus. He was talking about the Son. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Bible says He will tell you about the Son. Today, the church is talking about things, the blessing, things. I mean, you go to a church service and the whole hour, it's all about things. I see God is going to bless you. I see a car. In the, oh, excuse me? Even a pagan who can work and protect his credit rating and, and do some practical things can get a car. Of course, God can open a door for me miraculously. But the church is talking about things rather than talk about the Son of God. Present Jesus to the people. That's what the apostolic movement should be all about. When Jesus Christ came in John 1 verse 18. Somebody turn off your microphone. Please turn off your microphone. Thank you. When the, the Bible tells us in John chapter 1 and verse 18 that our Lord Jesus Christ made the Father known. Another version says he demonstrated the Father. Another version says he manifested the Father. That was the mission of our Lord Jesus Christ. He came to make the Father known. And he said the Father and I are one. I and the Father are one. 
Today, you see the Father was in him. Today, our Lord Jesus Christ is in us. The Father is in us. And God wants us to become vessels, containers, carriers of God to make him known. We want God to dwell so much in us and among us and to reveal himself to all of creation through us as vessels. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 28. Listen to what Apostle Paul is talking about. He says, So we continue to preach, to proclaim, to announce, Christ to each person. We continue to announce, to proclaim, to teach, to declare, to manifest, to demonstrate Christ to every person. That's the mission of the church. That's the apostolic mission. In fact, the scriptures tell us in Romans 8, verses 18 to 23, all of creation is yearning, longing for freedom that comes from the glory, that comes from the sons of God, carriers of the glory. Let's go to Romans 18. Let's read that scripture quickly. 18 to 23. I want to show that to you. No, Romans 8, and start from verse 18. Somebody read when you get it. Romans 8. Yes. Hallelujah. You see that? Verse 19. Everything God made is waiting with excitement, with eager expectation for God to show his children's glory completely. The revelation of the sons of God, those mature in Christ will carry the glory. That glory is what will set the creation free. Even the tree in front of your house is looking at you, waiting for you to become mature so you can release glory. Your dog is looking at you, is waiting. When you come in, your dog and your cat look at each other. Any chance yet? Nah. He's still acting out the same way. He's still talking the same way. They're waiting. The earth is crying. I pray that God can open our ears so we can hear the groanings of the earth. The groanings of the trees and the flowers in front of your house and the rivers. So we may understand the responsibility God has put on us. And so as leaders this year, my role is to push you into that momentum, to give you something to hope for, to look for, to chase, something to want, to desire. You must ask for this desire from God. Frame it in your heart. Ask God to teach you how to frame the desire in your heart. Actually, you already know. When you meet that somebody that you like, you got their pictures all over the house. 
you'll be staring at a picture on the wall. A picture that can't even talk to you. You're going to have their picture on your phone, their picture on the, your purse, their picture by your bedside, their picture in your dining room, in your kitchen. You, you're going to have that. You will be looking at them and thinking of the many ways you're going to enjoy life with them. You begin to think of the different things you will do for them and they will do for you. If it is a car, you begin to imagine yourself driving it on the highway. Begin to desire this thing in your heart. Begin to think what it looks like. I say, Lord, reveal to us what these sons of God will look like. And reveal to us the hindrances and the obstacles, the things that are making it holding us back from getting to that level. You need revelation from God. In the book of Ephesians, Apostle Paul says, I pray that by the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you can know these things by the Holy Spirit. Angels come to teach you. You know, angels come to teach. Daniel was taught by angels. So you can, we can also walk individually and collectively and become the house of God again, filled with the glory. But you must, first of all, understand one thing. You must die to self and let Christ live in you. Christ has to live in you. And the measure of the life of Christ in you is directly connected to the measure of death to self in your life. You know, many of us have gone through some stuff and we've been trying to fix our lives by ourselves. Oh, yes, we have. That's the self. We're scared to talk to people. That's the flesh, the self, trying to fix it. We have developed, uh, developed uh, 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 coping mechanisms and defensive mechanisms so I don't get hurt again. That's the self in action. It's not dead yet. When you surrender that to God, and it's not going to be easy, when you surrender that to God, say, Lord, I step back. You take over. Let me tell you something. Walking with God is a risk-taking business. He doesn't tell you everything. He told Abraham, get out of your house, go to a country, I will show you. Come on, how do I know to go north or south? Just pack and start, lift my feet and begin to walk? How do you tell a blind man, go to the river and wash your face? Hey, I'm blind. You can tell me to go to the river, open my eyes first. That's the way God operates. The Bible says, as he began to walk, he saw. So the fear Fear is what's holding you back from obeying God. And so you try to fix it yourself. And so you can look at somebody and analyze somebody. Oh my God. Whew. Many of us are still single because we overanalyze the person God sent to us. And we walked right by that person. It's the flesh. Satan knows how to attack people and set them off course. I publish some prayers that I do and some things that I write on my website. I would like more traffic to the website. Listen to those prayers. 
read the things that I have published. Listen to those videos. But don't just listen and then say, oh, that was nice. I would like to know what has changed. Don't just listen once. Study it. Work this out in your life. Make some decisions and follow through. Death to self is something that you do every this one decision at a time, every situation at a time. Developing the habit of using your power, enormous power God gave us to say yes and no. And it is God who empowers us in our inner man. But you have to get into the word. Most Christians don't spend much time in the word no more. They listen to the preaching. They watch it on television. But for somebody to sit with the Bible and, and you find somebody, turn off the TV, turn off your phone and take three hours. The same three hours you invest in television every day. And try to go into the word. The word of God is food. That food will make your inner man strong. Why are you doing that? Are you trying to say something? I, I can't tell. You have to. You're doing this. And I can't tell. You have to make a sign that I can understand. What is it? Oh, you didn't have to interrupt me. So, you, yeah, you, what I mean is, you can go. I, I think it's being recorded, if I'm not mistaken. You will get it. And so, uh, being focused. These are some of the things, if you do this consistently, be consistent. Avoid randomness. Don't do it today and not do it for two weeks. Create a schedule for yourself. Come out of the laziness. Wake up at 3 a.m. The first time is going to be hard. Trust me, you will not die. Develop a fasting habit. Every, day, every week. Choose a day and fast. Fast the whole day. From sunrise to sundown. And then gradually you will fast three days. But don't just fast, don't just not eat. If you, all you do is not eat, that's a hunger strike. Set your mind. Shut off all the other noises. Focus your mind on the Lord. The beholding. Imagine the goodness of God. Many Christians don't like the word imagine. But your imagination was given to you by God. Our Lord Jesus Christ taught people that imagination is reality. He said, if a man looks at a woman and imagine having sex with her, you already committed that act. That's in your imagination. When you begin imagining things, your whole body responds. That's because it's real. Imagine being with the Lord. Your imagination is the screen upon which God projects revelation, visions, and stuff like that. Learn to close your eyes and look within. I have a lot of teachings on our YouTube channel and on the media center, uh, on our website, that you can go through and, and just study and pray through them. And, and they so I haven't actually really gone deep. Up to now, I have given things just kind of introductory. From this year, I will, I eventually, I will begin to go a little bit deeper, depending on who I'm speaking with. But we have to cultivate the desire. We have to, uh, we have to, Behold and contemplate, and we have to anticipate 
and we have to learn to expect, create expectation in your heart. Your expectation determines what you get. Most people don't go to church with the expectation. But if there is a new preacher from California, then they expect a miracle. Then they get a miracle. But they do not expect the same thing from the regular pastor. That's why most of the times, pastors don't perform many miracles in their own houses. Even Jesus did not do well in Capernaum. They did not expect. You have to learn to pull out of the man or the woman of God. So, I just wanted to set us on course for the Momentum 2017. To, to give us a little bit, I will talk again a little bit about this on Saturday. We'll have another call at uh, 3 p.m. Central Time so that we can uh, lay the foundation. Uh, we just started using Google Hangouts. It helps us to fellowship because we used to do the telephone conference line, but with Google Hangout, we can see each other, we can become more familiar with each other, we can build the relationship so that we can become uh, one family uh, like that. And so uh, on certain days, I open the, the floor for question and answers. And, and so sometimes when I try to teach a topic, I do not open that door. So, uh, any questions, you can address them to me, email me, uh, whatever you do, just get the question to me, and then we can find time to pray and to talk and uh, discuss a little bit more in depth, because each one of us, these things will grab you a little bit differently based on the things that you are facing in life. So. Uh, uh, we can begin to thank God for his word and to ask him to give us his desire. We open our hearts to him so, so that we can receive from his heart to our heart the desires and intentions of God and the thoughts of God and the mind of Christ into these things. Lord, we thank you tonight. Just open your mouth and just thank God for the word tonight. Lord, we thank you, hallelujah, for this word tonight. We thank you, God, for the revelation that comes out of this word. We thank you, O oh God, as we open our hearts to you, that you are releasing into our hearts your own desires and your own purposes and intentions and plans and mind for us as your people. I pray that you are revealing to each one of us and those that shall listen to this afterwards things pertaining to their own lives that they have to reckon with to get to this place of oneness with you and, and intimacy with you and fellowship with you where we can walk with you like our Lord Jesus Christ walked with you always honoring him that we may honor the father in all things and at all times that we may be pleasing to you in everything that we will not seek to please ourselves that we will be hearing the voice of the good shepherd familiarize us with your voice O god until we become the voice in the wilderness lord i thank you for opening the ears of our inner men and the eyes of our inner so we can see you, so we can hear your voice. I give you the glory and I give you honor in the name of Jesus. Amen.